This is an idea, a little bit of philosophy type of talk. Uh, I'm, I'm here somehow to present some of the things that we've been doing, but also to ask questions and maybe to challenge some of the things we do. Uh, really, thank you to CWP, to Dave and Paul and, and colleagues for inviting me. It's a great opportunity to be here. To, I'm sure it's going to be a great learning experience. And yesterday, Paul, you mentioned you don't probably discuss enough with geologists at mines. I'm a geologist, and I'm in your room, so I'll be glad to discuss here in the next month. Um, obviously, I'm going to present an aggregation of a lot of work that we've been doing, so I'd like to thank my PhD students who are sitting now there, their names coming along, and, and the sponsors which uh, support me in this research, and a couple of people who also collaborated in this talk. Um, one of the things that really strikes me hearing all of these talks is the number of times where we, we hear optimal, simple, good. Um, like, we like simple solutions, we like deterministic solutions for our problem, even though we know that the subsurface imaging problem and the subsurface description cannot be solved exactly. Right. We know that our models and our pictures have to be approximated, but still we are striving to get these deterministic views of the surface using as much physics as we can. Uh, and we, we get an excellent example of that uh, here this week. Um, and, and that's good. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of picture we get with classical seismic methods, not even the advanced stuff that have been presented here. Uh, this is a, a 2D seismic line. Uh, process by Grant Taylor from the University of Hawaii, the Gulf of Florida, uh, published in JGI a couple of years ago. And uh, we do see a number of things here. We do see a number of false horizons, and uh, this is one of the years where we have a, a rift occurring. We have an extension rate for about between 10 and 30 kilometers wide, and the extension rate is about 16 millimeters per year. Okay, so that's a bit more than half an inch extension for your so it's a very uh, active, uh, extensionally active area. And there's a number of questions that are being asked in that area. And so um, when I get at this type of data as a geologist or when my search for uh, geologists at least get that they tend to make interpretations. So I've tried to do this exercise and well I've tried to place some poles manually like in the fancy stuff of, uh, of Dave. Um, and then I came back a day later and then I started over again. And that's another solution that I got. Um, and actually, I like to care about this one is better than that one. Uh, maybe we're not using exactly the same concepts. Um, but the still, I mean, there is a reducible uncertainty when we do that, when we move from this feature to that feature. So we have seen that we see that in a little bit, we have faults that appear, that disappear. And the question is right now, without any additional data, I'm unable to tell this model is better than that one. And probably if I gave that section to any one of you, I could come up with other possible solutions. And so we could argue for weeks to say, well, my, my model is better than yours, but maybe we have better things to do. Ah. So one of the things I'm, I'm interested in is trying to, to know, okay, which of this interpretation, I mean, how can we try to be more objective in, in this interpretive process? And and what is the details? I mean, what is the minimum size, the uh, full size that I want to, to interpret in this data? What is important, what is not so important with regard to a particular question I want to ask in my subsurface model? Um, I'm going to take another example, um, which is coming from uh, 3D seismic data sets, which I, I can't show you, but just, I'm just showing you a small part of it. Um, and Structural interpreters are identifying a big fault, which is a boundary, a boundary of the reservoir. And it's a major fault that we, as you can see fairly clearly, has been identified by some structural reasoning and looking at the seismic data in 3 But there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that fault. Um, so, one of the questions that arise there is okay, we could have various scenarios. So this would be a continuous plan of fault. This could be a curved fault. This could be a segmented fault with three segments. So we see a, a depth map of uh, the top of a reservoir horizon here, and then these various uh, fault configurations. And in the three segments, 
scenario, we can have a small bridge for the here that occurs within the, the video. And so this is a, a, a map view, and what you see on the bottom is a 3D perspective view of the faults with a juxtaposition diagram of the reservoir units. So yellow is reservoir against reservoir, and the pale color are reservoir against uh, what's below the reservoir, so don't the reservoir. <coughs> so, do these details matter? I mean, does it make any difference to take one single fault, a curve fault, or a segmented fault? And so one of the ideas we had is, okay, what we'd like to do to our in the company is, okay, if we have uncertainty, we want to reduce it, then what, why not try to use cross topography? So put a source down the wall here, and propagate the wave, and the uh, receiver somehow in the southern part of the wall, and try to see if we make any difference between the various scenarios. So we made a very simple assumption with two homogeneous uh, layers with an acoustic uh, approximation. And what we see is that we do see some little changes in the right time here. So we could say, well, maybe we can reduce the certainty of our sports uh, under a very simple Another type of question that we may want to ask is not always, okay, uh, if now this is an unconventional plane and I want to do a fracture. Um, I need to get a fairly good handle on the stress taking of the surface. And so, if we also make a recidivated assumption, uh, assume that we have a homogeneous elastic uh, model and that the fault is a weak material with a much, uh, much uh, weaker material, and we apply some perfect stress in the model, this is what the, the, the strain will look like. And if we make this type of assumption, uh, the elastic assumption. We will be able to, to uh, compute the stress and analysis the stress state in this reservoir. And so we also see quite significant variability about the main orientation and the main intensity of the stress uh, in, this, in this case. And the last type of application, which is probably what most of my sponsors care about, is what about flow. We have this big fault here in the reservoir. We want to simulate flows. So we have a an aquifer on the south which is fairly uh, strong, which is maintaining the pressure in the reservoir. If we put production we have here and we pump the oil, after a few years we will have, uh, we can simulate the flow and we will have a number of uh, profiles, um, saturation profiles. And we see that just without changing the porosity and permeability field of the reservoir, but just changing the location of the faults and the amount of displacement, uh, we will have significant production. Uh, Variations in the production behavior. So basically, the message here is that this uncertainty matters to the number of questions that we want to ask to our subsurface model. Um, so, this is a scenario based type of method. We have four models. Uh, I took a while to create those. Uh, actually, if we want to be more uh, systematic, we have to find a way to stop all these uncertainties. So, how are we going to do that? Well, that's a tough question. That's requires us to do or to tell what we don't know about the reservoir and to use probability distributions to, to make that variable. Um, before getting there, we could look at the sources of uncertainties. So we have a number of sources. Basically, we have measurements. Uh, but as this has been told during this week and as we all know, we have incomplete knowledge. We have a limited resolution of, of the physics. We have a limited bandwidth. Of our seismic wave. We have averaging effects, and we have a uh, lack of contrast. Sometimes, just, I mean, the permeability may vary without having a, a significant variation of elastic properties. Um, and we need to create a model from that. So, what we do is do some sort of processing. We have to choose a type of processing, a number of hypotheses uh, to be used in this processing, um, find some parameters for which we we can get a sense about with experience, but it's always a somehow quite subjective choice of parameters that we're making during processing. And last but not least, we have geology. Okay, the things we are trying to represent are maybe can be summarized by belief functions, but they have a geological origin and probably could be many objects of knowledge in there. But we have to make sure that the concepts that we're using are correct. And uh, it's a tough question to ask a geologist. Are your concepts correct? Of course, it's going to say yes, but maybe somebody will say no. Uh, and 
there's also a problem with repeatability, uh, as, as was illustrated before. Um, so I'm not going to go into this, I'm just going to try to discuss how we can capture these uncertainties in the form of geometric and topological uncertainties in terms of this model. And I will take the examples of structures, of geometrical structures. Uh, one of the first things that we care about is the connectivity of the subsurface objects, and especially the connectivity of faults. So in this animation, you can see uh, two fairly different scenarios with a, a green fault that cuts the uh, horizon here, and that may or may not connect to a blue fault, uh, which gets back to what Jimmy was doing, uh, was presented yesterday. Uh, so this is very important, and this is very consequential, because this is going to affect the connectivity and the compartmentalization uh, of the reservoir. Um, if we go down a little bit in scale, sometimes we, we, we get some interpretation of the subsurface structures uh, by the set of points, and if these points represent faults, we are not quite sure. We have some color associated to the point, but in the end, we are not quite sure what are the surfaces that should be uh, that should be consistent or represent the, the object that we sample with this point. So we have a number of possibilities to associate these points together in the form of surfaces and course or localized deep surfaces. Now we also have uncertainties in the stratigraphy, and that's why uh, I was uh, quite excited by the early talk. Um, we've been working, as they said, on a very similar method but trying right to uh, Run the dynamic model uh, stochastically to come up with various uh, layer, uh, various geometries, and uh, uh, topology or connectivities of the layering in reservoirs. So basically, what you see between these two models is the overall picture, but you see that pitch charts are organized in many different places, both naturally and vertically. Um, we can generate independences consistent with these layers and convolve with a wavelength to obtain a synthetic size with data set, but that would be a way to try to, to sort out uh, which of these models is most likely. But essentially, uh, a lot of this uncertainty occurs at the surface of scale. Like, you know, it's uh, too high frequency to be seen from the bigger waves. Uh, now, if we do the same exercise and use this layering to represent vulnerability and porosity and run the full simulator, so we inject water here and, uh, and water flow the reservoir. Obviously, these heterogeneities will have an impact and they will affect uh, the field compartmentalization and the flow units. So, this, this is the type of topological uncertainty that we want to address. Uh, and of course, on top of that, we have geometric uncertainties. So, one of uh, the examples which I borrowed from uh, Emmanuel Brignotten from the Front Paradigm is Basically, we have tech depth conversion uncertainty, we have velocity uncertainty uh, that we can try to propagate uh, through migration, and that ends up, that's, that ends up with um, uncertainties in the way we are going to uh, locate faults and horizons in the subsurface. And so we can evaluate things uh, without changing the topology. And last but not least, even if we don't change the topology, we still have some uncertainty. Uh, I was mentioned, um, and Jimmy mentioned that, but if we look at the fault displacement, what we get a, a pretty good handle on uh, when we do static interpretation is a vertical fault displacement. But we have no idea, unless we have a very nice channel cutting through this fault, we have no idea about the stretch speed, the amount of stretch speed displacement. And so that's also something that we can look at. So you might have one other. Well, because we need that to look into the positional space in which we can represent the sedimentary and heterogeneities. So if we change the strength of this basement, we're going to change how we coordinate what's, what is seen at the well on one side of the fault and what is seen at another well on the other side of the fault. And this can have an impact on how we are going to horizontally coordinate our, our sedimentary levels. So, how do we do that? I mean, how do we stop all these uh, structural uncertainties? Um, first, a few sensor to you guys, and I'm sure is to say, okay, let's use some random fields about the velocities and, and try to propagate uncertainties throughout seismic processing. 
This is going to be tough. Um, this is going to take a lot of computational effort. Um, but probably that's a good way to go. Uh, and but this will not capture the uncertainties, the interpretive uncertainties, like the subjective uncertainties of uh, the geological concept. So you could hire hundreds of interpreters, but I'm sure this is not the kind of thing your manager is ready to do, especially in these days. Um, so what else can we do? Well, we can use computers. Uh, we can use geostatistical type of methods. Uh, what is classically used in the industry is this type of method where we start from the reference model and we are going to vibrate it around. Uh, there was a very nice you know, paper in the Geostat Congress by Peter Abramson from the, from the Norwegian Computing Center, which relates the depth and certainty about the horizons to the uncertainty about the, the internal velocities uh, in the time to depth conversion. And so this is currently what is done by most of the subsurface modeling uh, packages. Uh, this type of vertical stretch and squeeze method uh, based on this velocity of service. We can do the same about faults. Like if we have uh, an uncertainty vector about the reference for surface, we can vibrate it using random fields. So, simulate some, some perturbation vector and then apply it also to the fault. Um, so this is, I would say, the easy part, like the geometric perturbation. We've, we've known how to do that for the last uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, now, what about the difficult part? What about the, the, the topology of uncertainties I've discussed so far? Uh, before getting there, uh, we need to have a look at the, the geometric perturbation on a new type of methods to represent geological structures. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you are used to representing horizons and faults as surfaces, like 2 degrees or triangulated surfaces. For the last 10 years or so, uh, there's been a new way to represent surfaces by data sets. Uh, so basically, we are going to represent a scale field, like shown here, and the equipment and show of this scale field in 3D would be the surfaces, the geological surfaces that we want to represent. Um, and this is really nice because this makes a lot of geometrical computations much more robust and it makes a lot of automation um, possible as compared to classical surface based model. So, if we have this type of representation, we can still perturb its geometry by adding a 3D correlated random field and um, coming up with a new 3D scale field whose equipotential will be perturbed as compared to the reference. Um, if we potential show on the other day form. <coughs> so, with that, we can change a little bit the geology by, by doing, by the topology, sorry. Uh, like if we have horizontal contacts in this surface and we do uh, horizons and roll down, they will disappear in some small blocks. That, that becomes possible, so we, can, we have a limited amount of topology opportunities which is allowed by this method. But not the kind of um, amount that we're interested in when we want to look at faults and um, fault and services. So that's one thing we, we started looking at with my uh, PhD student, Nicolas Charco. Uh, so basically, what we started from was, what, sorry, what we started from was a, a sparse data set, like you have a, a sparse set of, of 2D seismic sections which you have interpreted by hand or with some automatic, met some automatic method. So you have a couple of horizon peaks and fall peaks. These can be, these can have some uncertainty vectors associated to them. Uh, and you can also have some zones where we don't want to, to see any fault uh, occurring because we need to see a good coherency in your seismic effects. And what you need to do to support logical uncertainty is also to translate some prior geological knowledge into a number of statistical parameters. Um, so you, you, you're going to need to specify how much fault you want in your model. And this can be a range, like I want between 4 faults and 15 faults in this model. Um, you need to specify some prior orientation that you will get from regional knowledge and from uh, yeah, regional geological knowledge. Um, so the idea is about the, the roughness of the fault, the curvature of the fault, so much non-planar fault would be. Um, some rules uh, about structural geology that how does the, the vertical displacement relate to the fault size, 
This is fairly west of the French Montreal, we have that information. And we also, we also see power loads uh, between these two parameters, uh, and so on and so forth. We can also do the sustainability of the age of the farmers to families. And so, in this first data concept, uh, context, what Nicolas Charcot um, came up with is a method where he sequentially simulates four services and then simulates a spectrography offset and these services using all, all this information in a small data set. So, this is your input data, the set of problems, these big plans, and interpreted with four horizons, and this is the output. And uh, well, actually, this is accepted in the journal of your state since last week. Another uh, type of topological uncertainty that we may want to look at is at a much smaller scale. Like sometimes when you try to pick a fault you, from, from inline or from cross line to cross line, you see it, but you see some branches, and sometimes you use to use it, it's really a lot, so you don't actually have the time to look at them. So I think the, the beauty of the fault tracking method and what Jimmy is doing is that you, you can see that, that there's always going to be a, a, a scale at which you are not going to see anything on the seismic. So you're going to have some uh, seismic sections in the particular faults, uh, which may not be planned at large, at large scale, and what people usually do is predict one single fault of the scale. What we did with uh, another PhD student, Charlie Julio, uh, is to uh, find a way to downscale this one surface interpretation. So based on curvature, based on structural geology analysis, uh, we, we try to come up with various small segmentation scenarios, and not only with the form that I showed at the beginning of my talk, but like a very large number of geometries and uh, topologies for this fault. Okay, so this is the study right here. Um, this has obviously an impact on the volumetries. If we, if we look at the fault in the reservoir, we see the, the displacement will not be the same. The reservoir closure will vary from one realization to another. But this is not, when you look at in person, that this is not a very strong impact on the accumulation. We played the game of treating these various geometries with classical uh, flow simulation uh, corner world geometry grids uh, and simulate flow in the Eclipse. And what we see when we do that over the last number, about 100 realizations, what we see is that the uncertainty that we are telling the production curves on two production wells here uh, well, is significant. Uh, so, once again, this type of uncertainty matters. But what is scary is that our reference interpretation, like our initial deterministic surface, this guy here, is one of the end members of the various possibilities. It's almost like an extreme curve. Like it's overestimating the production of well one and underestimating the production of well two. So the good news is probably that globally that reservoir scale everything average out and we're not so far off. But, but that's still a bad news when you when we are gonna have to face uh, well field development or redevelopment decisions like where we place it if you want because our, our base case model, our simple model, will be quite wrong as compared to what it exists actually in the subsurface. And obviously, uh, we're not going to do that right away, we need to history match. But maybe we will history match by changing the probability somewhere and not looking at one of the possible causes of uh, this uncertainty and variability. So, uh, I guess I'm going to conclude now. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, back in 2004, uh, we had a lot of discussions with Albert Caracula. And uh, Albert challenged me and said, well, imagine you are in the North Sea. Can you generate a movie with an infinite number of geological models based on what you know on the geology of the North Sea? Like, you know, it's a pretty graphic color, you know the, the geological history, the technical history. Could you generate these kinds of models, of 3D structural models of the subsurface that could solve that? We are not yet there, but we are close. And we really glad about that, and we really sorry that uh, Albert is not here to see that. Um, and, and I think this is a very important point because 
as physicists, uh, we tend to see things from our own prism of, of physics. And, but, but when we look at reservoirs and when we are uh, in, in a company, when you are a company, you want to integrate data coming from different sources. And I think geology and geological knowledge can be a common factor, a, a common thing that you want to represent uh, these various and, and assimilate these various pieces of information. Um, so we could try to sample this uncertainty and then generate this idea of problem and then try to solve or just discard the models that are uh, not compatible with some piece of physical information. Obviously, that's not the most effective way to do that because even the biggest companies in the world don't have the ability computational power, as John mentioned uh, on Monday. Uh, so we need shortcuts to keep the model, the complexity of the model manageable, and that's why I'm really excited to be here because obviously I want to try to get as much as we can from the current, currently used seismic picture, and that's why I'm so happy to, to discuss the work with the and engineers. Um, we have a number of hard problems uh, to try to move on. Um, one is uh, basically what we agree is, is downscaling. What, what I've shown on the fault is downscaling. Like we have a, a large scale picture of something and we want to go into the detail. The question is where do we stop? Where should we stop? We can go down to scale to the poor to the poor scale. It's, it's, it's impossible, it's unreasonable. So, the good news is that um, complexity, I mean, chaos theory tells us that there is usually a scale where we can stop and compute some equivalent properties. The bad news is that when we look at fractures and faults, uh, they are often uh, found to, to follow power laws. So, so, they have spatial distributions that, that have no representative scale. So, we don't really know where to stop there. Uh, and, and finding these laws, uh, I mean, with this appropriate scale is still a, a, a really fundamental uh, question that we have to, to face. Uh, another problem that we had is as compared to our optimal models, where we can take some reference model and run some computation and compare, and to get a sense of how much we can get from our models. With uncertainty models, we can't do the validation. We cannot do a validation. Uncertainty is what we want it to be. So we have a process that leads us to some uncertainties, but we cannot validate that against ground proof because if we know the ground proof, the uncertainty is zero. Um, and that's, that, I think, needs a careful scrutiny and analysis of how we do things. Uh, and I think that's, that's very important. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you a lot for your attention.